My name is Emma Short. I'm the Senior Publisher for Primary Mathematics at Oxford University Press. Uh, and I'd like to begin um, with an acknowledgement of country, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, uh, from wherever we're, we're joining the meeting. And I'd also like to pay my respects to First Nations elders past, present and emerging. Uh, here in the Oxford University Press Office in Docklands, we're presenting uh, from Wurundjeri country, an Aboriginal Australian nation of the Woi Wurrung uh, language group in the Kulin Alliance. Um, they occupied the Birurung or Yarra River area of Melbourne before British colonisation of the same area. So welcome you all to this evening's round table. Um, Matt, can we see the next slide, please? In our session today, we're going to discuss the Primary Mathematics Skills Gap Report initiated by Oxford University Press. Um, and we have uh, a panel with us to discuss key issues and uh, solutions and challenges. And at the end of the session, if we have audience questions, uh, we will respond to those and we'd like you to use the chat if you could um, to make questions or comments as we go along. So um, our panel today, we have um, Lee Walker, who is the Director of Publishing, Editorial and Design at Oxford University Press. We have Peter Sullivan, Emeritus Professor, Professor in the School of Curriculum Teaching and Inclusive Education at Monash University. Peter is well known for his foundational work on the development of the Australian curriculum mathematics and uh, during his long career combining research into task design with the development and trialling of teacher support and, and classroom resources. And Peter, of course, also uh, presents and writes for journals and publishing houses, including Oxford University Press. We also have Peter Ma, Coordinator of Mathematics at Essendon and Penley Grammar School. And as well as a long career in classroom teaching, uh, Peter is a prolific author too, uh, writing for Macmillan Education and Oxford University Press, and is also a presenter of professional development. And in 2021, uh, Peter received the Medal of the Order of Australia for his services to mathematics education. We have Janine Sparkle on our panel as well. She is the National Partnership and Engagement Manager at the Australian Maths Trust. Uh, both a primary school teacher and a teacher educator, Janine has worked in schools across the country, growing teacher capacity and enhancing student engagement. So I think we have uh, quite a full house out there in the around the virtual round table now with just a few more people uh, entering but we'll um, kick things off with Lee Walker who will give us a bit of a summary of uh, OUP's research into the knowledge and skills gap in Australian primary maths classrooms. Over to you Lee. Thank you and thanks everybody for being here in between probably getting home from work and getting ready for dinner. Um, so it's a good 45 minutes that you can do some professional learning with us. So, yeah, thank you very much. So earlier this year, OUP um, did some research and um, included in that research was a survey that went out to teachers from all, all around Australia. And we got really fantastic responses, responses from 228 teachers from just as many schools um, from every state um, and from any, every type of um, school um, that is in Australia and the majority of whom teach mathematics and interact directly and daily with students. And the report reveals strong themes about the challenges of teaching mathematics to young students to prepare them for their futures. So if you haven't read it yet, it's a really good read. So I'm just gonna gloss over the findings, um, but you can really dig into it, into the report, which is really nice and accessible. But um, what the research report includes is a view of, a, of Australian student achievement trends in mathematics, the importance of assessing students all along their journeys. So it's interesting to see what teachers do and don't do at particular times of the year in terms of assessment and understanding where all their students are at. The challenge of transitioning from primary to secondary school. The impacts of inadequate progress on engagement, confidence, as well as anxiety levels. The importance of reading comprehension. And why teachers don't have time to teach all their students who have varying levels of knowledge and skills. Next slide, please, Matt. So this graph, you can see a number of national and international assessments, and we're focusing on the PISA assessment, which are the blue squares on the graph. 
And what this graph shows is that Australian students' PISA results have over time declined more steeply and consistently than in any other country other than Finland, and decline is greatest in mathematics. Next slide, please, Matt. Thank you. So we all know that maths gaps exist in every year. I mean, knowledge and skills gaps um, exist across all subject areas in every year. Um, we know that not every kid is at the same level at the same time um, during their schooling. But what teachers from the survey, um, from the survey design that we pushed out earlier in the year, what they tell us is that in any one classroom, primary students' levels of mathematical knowledge and skills range from one to five or more. Um, years, depending on the year of school. And as children progress through primary school, that gap continues to widen. So in the first year of school, more than 70% of teachers believe that students' gaps in knowledge and skills range from between one and two years, which, which you know, that, that's not unexpected, in my view anyway. By year three, the range increases from one to four years, with almost 30% of teachers claiming a three-year gap and 24% a four year gap. And in years four to six, most teachers claim that the knowledge and skills gap ranges from three to five or more years, with 33% of teachers asserting that the gap in year six is five or more years. So more than a third of teachers are saying, we've got really big gaps in year six. And similarly, we conducted um, some research the year before in 2021, um, which revealed that the size of the knowledge and skills gap in Australian secondary schools also ranged from one to five or more years, and with the widest skills gap in years seven, eight, and nine. Next slide, please, Matt. So teacher concerns are reflected in what I think is, is, is a really great statement. Um, it's quite profound um, from one primary educator um, from the survey responses. So what this teacher said to us was that for those who have strong skills, it is very hard to give them the time and attention they deserve to complete quality tasks at their level. And when there are significant, uh, there, when there are a significant number of students with major gaps, you need to spend time with them, filling in the gaps, of course. Those who are already behind can easily have their confidence further destroyed. Those who are waiting to get, to get your attention or quality feedback can become disengaged. And often you feel like you are not doing a good job at teaching any of the students. And similarly, from secondary teachers back in 2021, um, there are a couple of quotes that sort of summarise what our teacher responses um, collectively um, came back to us as saying, in that the spread of student levels has increased hugely over the past 15 years, to a point that it is virtually impossible for a single teacher in a classroom to successfully engage all students. And another quote um, from another teacher is that students are coming from primary school without those fundamentals, such as knowing their multiplication tables. They have no concept of number and reasonableness of results. They do not predict answers through estimation to understand the reasonableness of calculator answers. So without further ado, because I wanted to push through um, that summary of um, research so we can spend most of the session today in a really terrific roundtable with some really fantastic experts, mathematics experts. So I'll hand back to Emma Short to discuss implications with Peter Sullivan, Janine Sparkle and Peter Ma. Thank you, Lee. Um, and also thank you to the wider team at Oxford University Press uh, for putting together the research and investigation around um, the knowledge and skills gap. It's quite a piece of work that's been done um, by many staff in our office, which is great. Um, so first of all, we thought we would talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, the PISA results. Um, this is a story that we see in the headlines over and over again. Um, that Australia's results uh, in the program for international student assessment are, you know, on the decline. Um, but that's very much a, a big picture headline. And um, I'd like to invite Peter Sullivan to to tell us a bit more detail about what, you know, what that headline really means. Well, thank you, Emma, for the introduction, and thanks, Lee, for that for that uh, information and data. Yes, I'm uh, wanting to talk about the piece of predominantly, although the trends in in 
Tim's uh, are, are, are similar. Now, the PISA results have been in steady decline, more or less since the first the first time the results were were published and disseminated. Um, and so, uh, and the, the decline is also in English and science as well as as in mathematics in the international comparisons. Um, so the, the 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 there's two issues, I guess. The first issue is okay. What are the reasons for the decline? And and secondly, uh, you know, what are the gaps that that might be explaining those differences uh, that were represented in the data that Lee showed us, and and merely the experience of every single teacher, uh, in whatever school at whatever level. Um, the uh, now it's quite possible that the decline is not directly related to the way mathematics is taught. Um, now it, it does. The solution has to be connected to the way mathematics taught because that's really much the only aspect of society that the people in this webinar have any have any possibility of, of correcting or or improving. Um, but it may well be that uh, it's related to various uh, societal issues. Uh, it's probably not related to the quality of school leadership. It's probably not related to the amount of time the teachers have to plan. Because um, in terms of international comparisons, we have very high quality leadership. Teachers have adequate time to plan. Uh, we have a curriculum that, that's at least as good as the, the comparative curriculums elsewhere. Uh, we have resources, but at least partly, thank you to Oxford, um, that can improve the teaching. We have well-trained teachers um, now, you know, the graduate teachers coming out with master's qualifications. So it's probably not the way the, the way mathematics is taught. Um, and so we have to look at the data to see if we can actually get some insights into what might be some of the other factors that are contributing to um, to the gaps and to the decline. Now, um, I'm going to talk about uh, the students who are experiencing difficulty in a minute, but just to make the point that even the percentage of students achieving the top two bands, um, now roughly, uh, roughly 20% of, of the best students achieve the top two bands. And the percentage of Australian students achieving the top two bands has been progressively declining as well. But there are three there are three big uh, comparisons that are worth thinking about in to trying to understand the data or even the Australian context. The first one is uh, unsurprisingly that Indigenous students are three years behind non-Indigenous students um, in their achievement uh, on the on the PISA test. Now, by the way, just to emphasise that a three year gap in means is a very big gap. A three year gap in individuals is is, is not such a big gap, but a three year gap in means uh, is sort of saying every single student, you know, the, if you like, if you take the notional student uh, at the middle of the indigenous grouping, uh, is there's three years behind the notional non-indigenous student at the middle, and so it's a big gap and and. Uh, it's obviously one of concern, but there's also a three year gap between the students who are classified as remote. That's not regional, but it's remote uh, and the students who are metropolitan. Now, again, it's the same three year gap. It's not the same gap per se, um, but it's pretty similar to to that gap. But there's also another gap that's that's actually critical. It's also a three year gap. The gap between the lowest socioeconomic quartile and the upper socioeconomic quarter that's judged by parent occupation uh, predominantly and so uh, what that's saying is that the bottom 25 percent if if characterized by socioeconomic background uh, is three years behind the the characteristic of students who are characterized by parents who have a high socioeconomic background and so um, the the real issue the real challenge for us is to say well, OK, of the things that are in our capacity to affect, the, the things that we can do uh, to make a change, how can we on one hand arrest the decline? And uh, on the other hand, how can we how can we find a way to address the needs of those particular groups, those three groups? Now, there, there are some other groups that for which the gap is not so significant. For example, uh, recently, re the students who 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 migrated to Australia or students whose parents migrated to Australia, but they were born here, all do actually better than the rest of the cohort. 
And so that's not one of the factors that are likely to uh, be significant. But so the challenge of, of us, of everyone here, uh, is to say, well, OK, what can we do about it? What can we, how can we arrest the decline? How can we address the gaps? So it's, um, I know it's often sometimes tempting to say that, it, you know, it's kind of a broad cultural issue that, you know, Australia is different from Singapore, is different from other countries who do better on these tests. But when you look into it that way, Peter, that, that sort of doesn't hold up really, does it? That, because it, because of those, the sort of the diversity in those groups. Um, it's, well, in, in fact, the, the, the diversity between the groups is, is such an important issue. And, and by the way, those differences ha have been evident in more or less every PISA report um, that, that we've seen. And so the, the, the gap issues are, have, have maintained. Um, yeah, what, uh, I think there are factors that contribute um, to the Australian decline, some of which uh, may be related to, you know, the, you know, society factors un apparently unrelated, like the ready availability of iPhones or something. Um, but but how we how we address it, how we find the ways of conducting schools, uh, you know, how we you know, maximise student attendance, uh, how do we you know, maximise the time that teachers have with the kids? You know, these are going to be all important issues for us to talk about. Yeah, and I can can see in the comments um, that somebody has said that uh, students perhaps don't value the assessment tasks or the PISA assessment tasks because it doesn't count towards school marks. So it's perhaps not considered a valid um, assessment or benchmark. But you know, it does set the scene, doesn't it, for um, for a wider sort of conversation and and where you know um, where these gaps are coming from and and the areas in which we certainly have to improve. Um, you know, as a, as a teaching uh, cohort. Um, so we'll move on to some of the ways we can perhaps um, improve the situation, meet these challenges. And one of those is um, making maths, I guess, more relevant to the real world, um, bringing, you know, bringing maths uh, into the classroom as something that exists in wider life as well. It's, you know, not, not a theoretical subject. Um, and we're going to ask Peter Ma to discuss how and indeed why we should uh, focus on, on bringing maths into that real world context. Peter. There's no doubt that society is demanding more and more mathematics and science in the workplace. So the longer that we can get our students studying mathematics, the better it's going to be and the more employable that they're going to be. And engagement um, and motivation invariably comes from students being able to perceive the reason why they're learning what they're learning. Um, every year in February, we invite parents in, um, parents of children in preps and parents of children in years three to six, so that we can show them how we teach mathematics and English. And they are amazed at the changes that have taken place. But as the parents come into my maths room, I always let them have a little bit of a chat first and you can hear them talking about how they didn't like maths when they were at school. They couldn't engage with mathematics. They felt as though they weren't good mathematicians. And by the time we finish our session, I heavily emphasise the fact that we now constantly demonstrate the relevance of mathematics to real world situations, which is just so important. <clears throat> Every time we start a new topic, I always get the children to sit down on the carpet. We have a brainstorming session where they have to come up with reasons as to why we're learning what we're learning. Why, for instance, is the topic of decimals important? Where do you see decimals used in the in the everyday world? Uh, when we're teaching place value for argument's sake, which in my opinion is the most important topic um, in the mathematics syllabus. It's the one that we should be starting the year with, in my opinion, every single year. We need to relate the questions that we give kids to populations of cities and towns and countries. Um, um, debt, for instance, um, incomes. Maths is ubiquitous. It's so easy to find relevance. Um, when we're setting kids' homework, think creatively about the way that the children can use the skills and concepts that they're developing in the classroom and then apply it to what they find at home or in the community. In the pantry, um, 2D shapes, mass, 
capacity. Um, when the little ones are learning how to count backwards, uh, have a look at the microphone, set uh, the microwave at least, set it at 10 seconds and count the numbers back as you see them. Have a look at the way that the digital numbers are formed. When you're going for a walk in the community, walking with mum and dad or walking the dog, have a look at the numbers on the letterboxes. See if you can pronounce the numbers. Let's see how many digits the numbers have. Can you see that on one side of the road there are odd numbers, on the other side they're even numbers. Maths is everywhere and it's incumbent upon each and every one of us as maths teachers to constantly demonstrate that. When the kids see the reason for what they're learning, they have more motivation to learn. We learn maths at school so we can use it outside of school. Yeah, and I think that's a good point about uh, everyday maths too, Peter. Um, you know, we, we all know um, that kids are encouraged to read every day, read with mum and dad at the end of the day, the little ones. Um, it's just seen as something you should do, you know, to help kids reading, to be a good reader. But we don't often talk about, you know, do your daily maths or, yeah, find the maths at home, um, find the maths when you're out in the environment. It seems to... Um, it seems to be something that people can easily compartmentalise and and put away as something that was hard when I grew up. So I don't touch that now. But, but exactly. it is all around us. Yeah, and, and getting parents on side as a part of the learning experience is so important too. I don't think there's any question that the best learning comes in a triangular relationship where you've got motivated kids being taught by caring professionals, supported by parents, who are interested in the educational experience. There's no question about that. Get the parents on side and you're halfway there. Definitely, thank you. Um, another area we wanted to look at was, um, you know, the challenge of delivering good teaching for all students within a classroom setting. So no matter their level of ability, so all students can make good progress. And so all students can experience some success at their level, which is, um, you know, really important. So in your classes, what does good planning look like? Um, you know, how do you tackle that differentiated instruction? Yeah, and just to reiterate the points that have already been made, this is, in my opinion, the biggest challenge for classroom teachers to be able to plan lessons which will ensure that every single student in their class will have success. Um, the approach that I think that's most appropriate is called low threshold and high ceiling, where a lesson is planned so that every child can succeed to a certain extent. Those that are that require support may be able to get through some of the tasks. Um, the great bulk of the kids who are at standard will get through most of it. And yet it's so important that there's problem solving at the end to be able to cater for those really highly talented kids. Um, the PISA report tends to suggest that these are the ones that are missing out. These are the ones that are dropping backwards. These are our future leaders. These are the creative ones whose spark just simply has to burn brightly. Um, two of the worst things that can happen in a classroom is when the work is too hard and kids lose, drop their bundle, they lose their engagement, they lose their self-confidence and well-being suffers as well as their attitude towards the subject. And at the other end of the scale, if the work's too easy, our bright kids get bored. It's very, very difficult. It's not easy at all. Now, the next suggestion I'm going to make isn't going to please everybody, and it's not philosophically for everyone either but it's something that I've seen working extremely well and it's being used in many, many schools, and that's to plan by grouping kids. Um, if, for instance, you've got three classes at the one year level, you can plan for teachers, one teacher to take those who are struggling, who require extra support. One teacher will take those that are in the middle group and the teacher will take the kids who require extension. Um, it's a little bit easier doing it that way. It's not, as I said, for everybody, but it's something that does work exceptionally well, particularly for your very bright kids too. Um, kids know at a very young age when they're struggling um, and kids know very early on who in the classroom is the best at, the, at, at mathematics and those that, that require support. Um, it's a very practical way of working. It, I think it does work extremely well. Um, 
it's another thing to consider. And sometimes that support come from peers, um, you know, working working across groups, you know, matching up some of the, the less able kids with more able kids. Can that sometimes work in a classroom? Um, absolutely, yeah, indeed. Um, and when you start a lesson, have all the kids on the floor. Um, tell the kids what they're going to be doing and what the demands are. Get them back, um, get them working. You can have support groups absolutely within the classroom and it's so essential by the end of the lesson that you get them back on the floor together mm -hmm. so that they can discuss their results and they can learn from mm -hmm. each other children think in so many different ways um, kids need structured problem solving they need a problem solving approach they need to have that sort of scaffold to solve these types of problems that we're going to be giving the kids they need to know that the most important thing to do when you is, is to read a question, to know exactly what you need to do. They need to look for patterns. They need to have a go and see if their answer works. Is their answer sensible? Tinker with it if it's not. Use a table or a chart. Work backwards if they need to. Draw a picture. Some kids are very visual in their thinking. Um, make a model. Use blocks. Use paper. Think logically. What answers don't work? And when you get all the kids back on the car, up at the end of a session, you'll see the kids will appreciate as they share their answers that kids think in different ways and they learn from each other as a consequence. And something you touched on there, which actually I wanted to pick up, um, I think Lee, you also mentioned it in your summary, was just that the issue that reading comprehension can play, um, you know, in, in learning maths as well, the, just the different literacy abilities can have a bit of an impact there as well. Exactly, exactly. And getting back to this idea of teaching problem solving in a structured way, um, what we get our kids at school to do is to read a question. If you don't know what's required, read it again, underline, circle the keywords, make a summary of the question, write the question, say the question out in your own, in your own words. And then if it still doesn't make sense, you can ask someone who's nearby to help you and maybe they'll get a nudge in the right direction. Um, but yes, reading is absolutely essential. Yeah, for sure. Reading comprehension is is one of the, the key areas that leads to success in mathematics. So there's no, no question about that. Yeah, sure. Um, well, we'll move on to Janine um, to talk a bit about assessment and planning. Uh, what are the most impactful changes to assessment that uh, teachers can introduce to better understand and, and plan for the gaps in your experience? I think um, we've moved a long way from having the end of topic assessment at the end of term and, and students being ranked according to where they fit in the class and all that kind of thing. I noticed that um, Singapore has recently removed that requirement in their classrooms. So students are no longer compared to each other. They're compared to themselves as they were six weeks ago or two weeks ago or a week ago. Um, so that's interesting. What I'd like to see and what I think is happening in lots of really great classrooms is there's formal and informal assessment. Um, and we're talking about feedback to students that's almost immediate, that they get that feedback and it's constant. We want the assessment to be small and often. So one question very frequently, um, and we want it to be incremental. So students have had the opportunity to achieve success. If we're linking it to reading, if you're a reading recovery teacher and you've learned how to pitch a, a book to students, students reading a book by themselves don't, um, don't need as much support, need more support than a student reading a book with an adult or with a, someone who can read sitting beside them. So if we use that analogy in mathematics, with a bit of support, students can do a lot of mathematics. Um, we want to plan to to have sort of access assessment rubrics so that the assessment or what we're assessing is explicit and in those things we're not just assessing content skills we want to assess disposition participation the valuing of mathematics as something beautiful and useful in and of itself and not necessarily contextualized so we we get the student voice in there and the students have some opportunity to say i achieved that rubric i'm aiming for this part of the rubric um, and then when we move to our planning, we've got to think, we've got to plan then to stretch every student. So we're not just taking the bright students and extending them. They're not the only ones who get extended. Everybody in the class is extended and learns and has some growth from where they began. The biggest, the most successful thing I've worked 
um, with lots of teachers all over the country. There are 9,700 um, classrooms in Australia, schools in Australia, and I would guess I've, I've visited personally nearly 2,000 of them. We've had lots and lots of school visits over 25 years. And the thing I know that works best for teachers, for their planning and for their professional development, which we'll get to later, is for the teacher to do the problem. Do the problem yourself. Think about where your students are going to trip up. Think about the maths that's involved. Think about their prior knowledge that will be required to answer this. Think about the practical things of rulers and, and, and protractors and bits of paper that they're going to need to solve it. And then you need to plan what you're going to say because you're the one that's in control of moving them on in their thinking, of keeping them thinking when they try to take you off task and ask you what you did on the weekend or ask, talk about your football team or all the things that they do to distract you. And they do, they push you right off track. Um, and it's your job to keep bringing them back. So you want to plan for that low fall floor, high ceiling problem as, as Peter and Peter have suggested, but you also want wide wall. You want to take them sideways and extend them sideways. So you don't want, as Peter said, in the last session, you don't want a grade five student necessarily doing year seven work. That's not doing more maths. We want it um, thicker and broader and deeper and gutsier than, than they're used to. So there's lots of things that, that teachers can do, but the single one is do the problem yourself. Yeah, and we've talked about that, um, that breadth, that stretch, the, the horizontal stretch rather than that, that vertical stretch being really important to give kids as much exposure as possible at that um, that level of the curriculum, you know, that they're at, definitely. Um, so when we get to the end of primary school and we're in grade six, um, what, what can we do, what can teachers do to ensure that, you know, all their students are as secondary school ready as possible? Peter Ma. Um, I teach at a school that's from um, kindergarten through to year 12. So I do have um, uh, our secondary schools at a different campus, but nonetheless, we, we still do have regular meetings with them. And the one thing that they keep on telling me is that when the kids come up from year six, they don't necessarily want them to be absolutely outstanding, but they do want them to know the basics. They want them to be to be conversant with our Hindu Arabic system of numeration and understand how place value works. They want them to be able to add, subtract, multiply, divide. They want them to have a basic understanding of fractions and decimals and metric metric measurement. Um, one thing I think that's also extremely important is that teachers are conversant with not just their own expectations with regards to the Australian curriculum for their year level, but at least one and, and hopefully more than one year, both above and below. So they know where their kids are heading. They know where their kids have come from. Um, I think that's, that is helpful in, in many, many ways. Um, the elephant in the room is of course, trying to assist those students who are our battlers. Um, the research that I've read suggests that we need to be able to catch these kids by the end of year one. Um, the EMU program, I think, works wonderfully. The Early Maths Understanding program that is uh, is becoming quite common in schools works wonderfully well. We've had it at our school now for a number of years, and we've found that the students who really struggle by the time they come up to year five and year six have had a lot of those holes filled. Um, so that's certainly one way of, of assisting and trying to get that gap down to uh, to as little as possible. And, you know, we are talking about um, generalist teachers here in the in the primary sector, and that probably leads nicely um, on to our next question for Peter Sullivan. We, we talk about the knowledge and skills gaps in relation to students. But do teacher, you know, does teacher instruction have gaps too? And, and how can we address that? Um, well, look, it's a critical issue. And I think what Janine said about encouraging teachers to do the problems um, it, and, and possibly, if it's all possible, to do it collaboratively with other teachers. Um, I think that because uh, often the, there are hardly any maths problems that can only be done in one way. Nearly every maths calculation or question can be done in more than one way, but sometimes it's hard to know that yourself. 
because you actually need to listen to other people. So that's sort of, I, I think teachers need to plan together. I think the major asset that a school has is the capacity of, and willingness of the teachers to plan and to think about the what, why, how of the maths lesson and uh, how will we know whether they've learned it. Those sorts of big questions about that relate to planning. I might just add uh, one more thing. So I agree with everything that Peter said, except for the comment about grouping. I think that there are very major risks to equity in grouping students by their achievement. And, and certainly it doesn't work in all schools. And I think that there are other ways that we can address the differences in students rather than grouping them and having what in fact people call self-fulfilling prophecy effects that actually have a detrimental effect on the long-term achievement of students who are classified as low achievers. Um, so um, I think it's not just low floor, high ceiling tasks. Uh, it's actually giving students time. It's actually preparing prompts for the kids who can't even reach the low floor. But it's certainly a, a, a about preparing prompts and extension opportunities for the kids who've achieved the high ceiling already. Um, I, I think that we have to try and find find ways of doing that and and being inclusive of students and using you know the collaborative processes that exist within classes and getting students used to the fact that that at least part of the the task of successful mathematicians you know when they enter the workforce is being able to communicate their mathematical knowledge and share their mathematical knowledge with with people from um uh, you know from from engineering from environmental science from uh, you know, marketing from engineering, you know, the 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 notion of being able to be multi multidisciplinary and accepting of of people at all levels is such an important idea. One of the things that that Peter did say that I think is important is is the capacity to engage parents. And I think this is probably not so much a challenge for us, but for governments, because I think the three targeted groups that I suggested before, that is uh, indigenous, remote, and low socioeconomic. Now, of course, there's a, lo a lot of overlap between those groups and some people are probably a member of all three. Um, but th they're less likely to be able to have parents who are willing to engage with the school, willing to uh, have the, the time and opportunity to engage with their kids. And so finding ways to, if you like, replicate um, the support that parents give your know, middle class parents give to their children uh, for those other groups is going to be an important, is an important challenge. Um, one a, a, a final point, uh, and this will be the last thing I'll say, so um, is that th there's a lot of talk about, oh, there's a, a decline in knowledge. We, we need one style, style of teaching or another. And I think one of the things we do, we don't want to do is to replicate the mistakes of the past and the very situation with parents coming to school feeling uh, anxious about mathematics um, is actually a, a, explicitly a result of the way maths is taught in the past. So finding ways to be more inclusive, um, more more multidisciplinary, uh, more ap more application focused, uh, and um, dealing with students where they are is really going to be such an important challenge for everyone here and, and teachers generally. Yeah, and I think you've all you've all made it clear how adaptable, you know, the generalist primary teacher has to be and within just even within the subject of mathematics, how many elements you've got to deal with there and, um, you know, how you have to adapt to each student, each class um, differently, which is, you know, definitely a huge challenge. So that leads nicely into our last um, topic, which is about professional development. And this is one, you know, for Janine, how schools or teacher associations um, can develop programs, you know, sustained programs of professional development and training to help develop and share uh, knowledge and expertise. So, you know, um, a great program isn't lost when a certain teacher leaves the school or or a new teacher comes in and everything resets and changes. How, how can we, you know, sustain that ongoing professional development? Exactly. Yep. Thanks, Emma. I think, um, this, this responsibility for professional learning at the system level, so at the jurisdictional level, you know, whether you're state school or an independent school, whatever, 
or at, at least at school management level. But then there's also a personal responsibility. Each of us as professional teachers need to take some responsibility for our own learning. And I call that a, a personal mathematical identity. And you need to build a cadre of um, professionals, colleagues around you. You can have those mathematical conversations with it. You can do that problem with and talk about what students might do with it. And if you're doing that at the whole school or at the individual level, then you've got a formal and informal professional learning program. One of the loveliest um, PL programs I've seen was about 30 years ago, actually, a teacher in the Western, principal in the Western suburbs who was fabulous. And he had wow days, watching others work days, where within the school, teachers got to see each other teach and they picked up strategies, but they also noticed that poster on the wall or that list of words on the uh, vocab and that kind of thing around the room that, that was useful that you don't get the chance to see. Um, whenever I go into school to model something in someone's classroom, I always get them then to do it the next time I visit and we talk about how they went with it. So there's that collaboration. So what we don't want is that PL session that gives me one activity on Saturday afternoon when I'm at a maths teachers conference that I can do Monday morning at 10 a.m. with my year eights and then it's over. That's not professional learning. Professional learning is sustained and, and ongoing. And one of the points I wanted to make, um, I think then is that's when you start to think about diversity within your classroom and diversity within your thinking about how mathematics is applied and if we can jump back a little bit to that addressing the gaps in the differentiation and the engagement chris matthews from atsima the aboriginal and torres strait islander maths alliance talks about student engagement especially for indigenous students but i believe these strategies work for all students if the student can relate the mathematics to themselves to the place that they are in to the, to their family to art science you know, religion, whatever it is around them, to their histories and the histories of other people, then they are going to be more engaged and they are going to want to do the mathematics and take part in the mathematics a little bit more with a little bit more enthusiasm than if they see themselves distanced from it. So the more connected they are to the maths, the more likely they are to engage with it. So I think that's our, our next challenge is to start to think about how can I not only be a better maths teacher and be better at the content knowledge myself, but what am I doing about the diversity of thought and the diversity for my students and how can I engage with them better? Yeah, that uh, that certainly brings it all together. We we haven't had so many questions in the chat um, in this session. We've had some comments, quite a few comments around maths vocabulary um, and so forth. So unless we have a few more questions, we're sort of at our wrap up time now. Um, you know, we'd like to thank all our speakers for their, their contribution today. Um, you know, you make us all feel like maths is actually in really good hands and we don't want to read the headline stories about PISA results because um, with experts and teachers like you looking after our children, you know, I feel like we should all be doing well, definitely. Um, if there is anything we've missed in the chat uh, this afternoon, we will endeavour to get back to you and we will have some information and a recording of um, our session available on the OUP website very soon. Um, we thank you all for your time. We know it is a difficult time between uh, work and home. And um, we hope you've all got taken something away from the session as well. Presenters, thank you. We will let you go and leave the meeting now too, as it's been a, a couple of hours of, of hard work from you too, and we appreciate it very much. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks very much, everybody.